So I don't, I don't necessarily think you need to sell. You don't need to manipulate. You don't need to cajole people into doing anything. What you do need to do is be really good at communicating how you can help people. Episode 103. This is The Business of Architecture. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where each week I speak with a successful architect, designer, or consultant to discuss tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. When you speak to the folks over at BQE Software, please mention this show. Because when you use ArchiOffice, you support Business of Architecture, which allows me to continue bringing you this content. Today is part two of my interview with Richard Petrie, the world's leading architect, marketing coach, and trainer. He leads the training over at the Architects Marketing Academy. You can read more about that at architectsmarketing.com. In this episode, you'll discover how to attract and land better clients, projects, and fees through the power of effective communication. And with that, here's today's show. All right, Richard, so welcome back to Business of Architecture. Nice to be back. (laughs) (laughs) Richard, I thought we'd focus these two sessions, so the last episode, which is 102, and this episode, 103, on the selling part of architecture. And sales and selling is almost a swear word, a curse word in architecture. Mm. What has been your experience yep. with that? Oh, absolutely. Look, most architects, a lot of architects hate to be seen as a salesperson. Um, and the irony is we're, we're all selling. I mean, we're all, whether we're providing accounting services or, or even um, even doctors, uh, you know, we're all selling our services or, or products. We sort of need to get into it. We sort of need to get over that a little bit. Um Ideally, I think architects would like just the world to come to them and see their great work and their work would speak for themselves and they would be referred so much that they would never have to um, do any selling at all. The truth of the matter is um, sometimes you're busier than you can handle and other times you need the work. So, you know, we, we do need to think about selling. But a better way of maybe saying it, is we need to get better at communication. So I don't, I don't necessarily think you need to sell. You don't need to manipulate. You don't need to cajole people into doing anything. What you do need to do is be really good at communicating how you can help people. And that's what architects don't do particularly well. Um, they talk about what they do, but we talked in the last one about uh, you know the, feet, the benefit busting, um, and there was a video we pointed people to. But, but you've got to be able to communicate how you can help people get what they want. So there's a good saying. Um, one is if you help people get what they want, they'll help you get what you want. And the other good saying is marketing is nothing more than finding out what people want and giving it to them. So marketing is nothing more than finding, you know, architecture is nothing more than finding out what people want and giving it to them. And we're not overly good at finding one we're not very good at finding out what people want that's that's the first problem because we don't ask very good questions and the second thing is we're not very good at at showing them how we can get them what they want we we get caught up in this uh we get caught up in saying things which which is not very clear because we're worried about things so so we're trying to do is help people communicate better well it's interesting you say that because uh, in one of my previous episodes, and what I've noticed is that every episode I've had with architects, um, where they are excellent communicators, I've had some great architects on the show who really do have that gift of communication. And if you look at their work, it's actually represented in the the kind of the caliber and the kind of work that they do. Stuart Magruder, who was on uh, six or seven months ago, uh, he's on the board of the AI Los Angeles, and he he's rubbing shoulders with a lot of really influential architects down there. And so he's had the time to study him, Richard, but I just say this to back up what you said. He said that in looking at these architects that are successful, the one thing he sees that's in common is they are all excellent communicators. Right, right. And, and you know, and the key to communicate, when we talk about communicators, there's people who are articulate, but that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about being able to communicate and convey how certain things that you're proposing can change someone's life 
in line with the way they want it to be changed. So I guess that's what I'm, that's the subtle difference, you know. For, actually, here's here's a good example. So uh, Marcus Marino, who you you know is known very well, we're at the um, Las Vegas conference and we're talking about one of the big themes that came through at the Vegas conference and the and the Petri method was around communication is around helping, you know, actually architecture is around helping people feel the way they want to feel, not just see what they want to see, but feel how they want to feel, you know, whether it's, I, I don't know what it is f- for me or, for, you know, for other people, but, but some people want to feel inspired, some people want to feel um, relaxed, some people want to feel safe, right? And, and, and as an architect, You've almost got to be a bit of a psychologist. You've got to be a marriage counselor. I've heard that a lot, you know. But um, you've got you've got to be a bit of a psychologist to find out what is driving this person and what's important to them. What's their hot buttons? Not just at a, at a logical, superficial level around what do you want? You know, how many bedrooms do you want, and you know, what sort of space do you want? But at an emotional at an emotional level, I'm going to slow this down. At an emotional level. So one really good question we had um, we're dealing with Marcus and we're trying to create a a bit of a pitch for him and, and um, help him communicate his value. And he was talking, I said, well, what do you do? Well, you know, he said, well, you know, architecture, like writing a song, it's, you know, it's, it's about feeling, it's about movement, it's about rhythm, it's about style. Um, and, and, and we said, yeah, that's right, you know, it, it is. So, so I'm not sure how this links to the next bit, but that's what he was saying. I thought it was kind of interesting talking about it like a song. But we'd have, one question we had for him is said, you know, we need to convert it away from getting superficial briefing to getting an emotional briefing, at least having some questions in there. So one question we designed for him was when he goes to speak to someone is, how do you want to feel in this space? You know, when you when you come home or when you come to your office, how do you want the space to feel? Um, and another way of doing that, of talking to that person's you know, sort of deeper needs is – have you ever, you know, say I'm the architect and you're my potential client, Enoch, you know, have you ever walked into a space, into a into a house and looked around and gone, wow, this place feels amazing, right? And you probably say, yeah, I have actually. So, okay, well, my job, you know, you, you tell me about that feeling that inspired you so much and you, you'll then tell me about that. Okay, that's great. My job is, is to try and give you that feeling in your house. Now, maybe we don't have the budget of that place that you saw. You know, maybe we don't have, you know, we don't have the budget. We don't have the, the range that they had. But through good design, we can still create, when you come home, we can still give people, give you that feeling. And that's my job uh, on your project. And, and some people will listen to this and go, that sounds kind of corny. And you know what? I don't care because it's not corny because that is the essence of what people want. They want to feel a certain way. That's a, that's the secret to anything, not just architecture. I use this in other areas. People have certain ways they want to feel. And if you can understand how they want to feel and then show them how by, by, by your designs you can get them to feel that way, you will, you will win so many more projects and you will break down so many more doors and you will wonder... <laughs> Uh, you will now. You will then know why you had trouble closing deals and winning projects in the past because this was the piece you were missing. So why, why does that, the, why does that not come naturally to a lot of people, Richard? Do you have any insight on that? Um. Oh, not really. I mean, I think I think we just we we just we just trained as we get older. We're trained to get more and more uh, intellectual, more and more analytical, and more and more logical. So we deal on a higher level. When you get back to, to, to dealing with someone's soul and someone's heart, and I think we, we lose that as kids. We're quite emotional as we're kids. And we learn to train that out of ourselves. We get more rational. So may, maybe that's why. But when you go back to that place, then what you end up doing is connecting with people on a, d- a deeper level. And, and most of the architects on this program, you have, you have had projects where you've connected really deeply with your client and you you really felt that you're on the same wavelength, and you really understood what they wanted, and what they felt, and what they what they wanted to feel, and what you know. And, and it was a great project. Likewise, I bet there are other projects where you just felt you didn't get that connection. You know, you, they were giving you a description of what they wanted, but and you were designing to that brief, but nothing it was like two singers slightly out of sync, right? 
And, and, and that's the difference, I think. When we're in sync, when we've got rapport with our clients, rapport is an emotional connection, right? And, and, and um, why yeah. do we lose it? I, I don't know. But, but when you're emotionally connected to, a, to another human being, whether it's a client or a, or a wife or a husband, then we're in sync and everything works. When we're not emotionally connected, then it, it, it doesn't work so well. Richard, it's very I, deep and meaningful, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had Frank Harmon on the show. Frank Harmon is a, just one of the, I think, one of the world's greatest architects living right now. I mean, he's, he's been mentored by Richard Meyer, and he does just a pristine, excellent work. And he's been going at it for a long time. I think he's in his, maybe his early 70s now, you know, so very experienced architect. But he said that one of the most effective questions he asks people to get at that is he said, imagine a room that you, that you had when you were a kid that you really liked to be in. And then tell me about that room and why you liked it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's coming in. It's, it's going into the same place. And if he's a great architect and he's, and, and he's doing it, then, then everybody else should be doing it too, you know. Um, that's a great way of doing it. I mean, another way to ask that question is imagine you, you've walked home and you've worked into your house and you're so proud of what you've got. You know, it's two years down the track or it's one year down the track and you're really happy with, with what you're seeing and it makes you feel good and everyone else is pleased with it and your husband's happy or you you know, what do you see? Because it's the same question asked from a different perspective as to what, you know. But, but those are the deeper, they're, they're slightly more... Uh, we're looking for different things. We're not just saying how many bedrooms do you want and, you know, uh, do you like curls and do you like, uh, you know. Like we, we, we're desi- or contemporary. We, yeah, we're designing for the heart. And, and you've, got to, you've got to include those logical things in it as well. But most people only include those things and they leave. And, and it, don't forget too, it's not how you want to feel when you walk into a house. You know, you're, you're the architect. Your job is to find out what they want to feel and then use your skills to give them that, you know, it's not about designing something for yourself that you're proud of. Um, it's about designing something which really hits the mark for them. And it may be, you know, it'll be very specific. It won't be, you can't generalize. You've got to go in and ask them. And that's why doing the diagnosis, almost doing an emotional diagnosis is very important. You've got to be armed with good questions to pull it out. And the top guys, I believe they do have their questions and that's part of what makes them great. Richard, you wrote this great, told this great story in a, a, a recent blog post on Architects Marketing about Joshua Bell. Would you recount that story for our listeners? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great story. I mean, I, I, I got it. There was a, it was a award-winning journalist wrote the full article on it. Um, but there was a, a Joshua Bell was one of the greatest virtuoso uh, violinists who can play the most intricate pieces. And he is, by all accounts, he was a child prodigy. He's now 30-something. <laughs> but when it comes to playing the, the violin, he's a genius. And they, the Washington Times did an experiment. And, and he had previously, about three weeks earlier, sold out the Boston Boston Philharmonic, um, you know, one of their theaters. Average ticket price, $100 per seat, and it was full. You couldn't get him. So what they decided to do is a little experiment to see if we took him out of that environment and we put him somewhere where he's completely incognito, what would happen? What would happen? So they dressed him up in some baseball gear and a baseball cap. Um, they gave him a um, they gave him you know a, a place to play, which was at an arcade just outside a railway station during rush hour. And they were, they, they were worried about a little contingency. They're saying, what happens if a big crowd forms and what happens about this and too many people are there and it causes causes problems and what about this? They needn't have bothered. bothered. Joshua Bell gets up. He's playing on a $3 million is it Stradivinsky, probably saying it wrong, but a $3 million violin. He, he opens his case. He starts to play. And you know what happens? O- over one hour period, virtually nothing. The crowd just walks by. A few people slow down. A couple of people stop. I think it was about seven people stopped in total, and there was a thousand and ninety-three people walked past them. They measured it all. They went and interviewed the people who who did stop, and uh, you know, why did you why did you stop? And ah, uh, yeah, it sounded quite nice. A um, thousand people walked past, only seven stopped. He made thirty-two dollars, thirty-two dollars 
in the uh, in in the hour. One lady recognized him, and, and she actually they took this out. She actually gave him twenty dollars, and they they didn't count that because she recognized him. But everybody who didn't recognize him for that for that one hour, he was worth thirty two dollars. Now, there's lots of morals or lessons we can take from it, but the one I take from it is. Unless you are surrounded by symbols and, and, and a story, unless you have a story wrapped around you, like he does when he's at the Boston um, Philharmonic Theatre, even Joshua Bell is only going to win $32 an hour because you could be the best violinist in the world and most of the people in the world aren't good enough to be able to identify that. Right, a couple, two people. One one person knew he was one person knew he was a really good violinist because that person was a violinist, and another person had see, seen him play. So two people knew, but the rest of them didn't know. They just he's a busker for all they knew. Now I think it's very similar to being an architect. Right, I am not an architect. I am not in a position to know whether Enoch Sears is a great architect or not. I can I can look at the nice pictures on his website, but then again, everybody's got nice pictures on their website. I don't know. You know, you all look good. All your pictures look good. So how? What am I to know? And so the the lesson for architects is you do need to think about this stuff. You do need to come up with what is your story because without a story, you're just another architect. You're just a you're just a, a, a violinist playing. In a, in, a, in a car arcade, you're, you're $32 an hour. With a story, you could be worth anything. It depends on how good your story is, but you need to think about what is your story, what, it, what makes you special, what make, what's your superpower, and then make sure there is a story built around you. you know? Well, let's bring that back home to Mona Quinn and talk about her story. What story did is she wrapped in and how did, was that to her benefit? Yeah, sure. So when we started, uh, probably three years ago, I said, what do you do? I'm an architect. Okay, do you specialize in any particular areas? Not really. I'm a generalist. Oh, okay. I'm thinking, oh, no. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> uh, right. Is there any particular area you're really good at or you really like? You know, oh, I like doing heritage buildings. Okay, right. Let's investigate that. So we investigated that. By the end of the meeting, I said, look, I'll tell you what I'd like you to do and have a think about it, go away and have a think about it and come back. But I'd like to position you as New Zealand's leading ca- character home architect. So that was the type of heritage building, character homes. So you are Mona Quinn, New Zealand's leading character home architect. And she says, well, I can't say that. I said, well, we don't. You know, we can get other people to say it for you. You know, um, we, we can write it down in the third person. We can we can write books. We can, it can be mentioned if you get in the paper. Anyway, so we built up that, that she was going to be New Zealand's leading character home architect. And, and it wasn't a lie. It's because no one else defines themselves as a character home specialist. No one else did. So, therefore, if she's the only one that defines her in that, she must be the leading one. She's the only one. So we did that. Um, well, hold and, on, and, hold and on, Richard. That's, that's, just, that's just unethical. Well, no, no, she, she, I know what you're saying, and I know you're speaking on behalf of everyone listening. Yeah. It's not only she – is, she is an expert in that area. Just like p- you listening to this thing, you're an expert in a particular area. Um, it's just that you're underselling yourself by being, you know, a vanilla architect. I'm a jack of all trades. I'm a master of none. I'm, you know, I'm a GP. If, if you chose to highlight and put a spotlight on the areas where you are really good, that are true, you are good in those areas – and call yourself an expert or a leading a leading architect in this area. It is true, right? It, it, it's it's not true to call you a jack, you know, just an average architect. It's not. In some areas, you're really good. So we put the spotlight on those areas. We don't exaggerate. We don't. If it's not true, you don't say it. But we do pick the area you are good at, and we accentuate it. Um. Anyway, before I was rudely interrupted. <laughs> So, so anyway, so, so so Mona became known. You know, she she got she got interviewed in the paper because she was an expert in this area. Um, she 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 got asked to attend events. A, about six weeks ago, she sent me a text saying, "Guess who's just been asked to be on the heritage board for New Zealand?" And I, I, that's probably not the exact words, but it was something like that. So I texted back, "Oh, was it me?" She says, "No, try again." So she's just been pulled onto this board because she's getting the reputation of being known as this person. Now, whoops, I'm 
it's not microphone over. If she was still the generalist and just doing a bit of everything, that would never have happened. She'd just be another architect, uh, a commodity, um, having her fees questioned, trying to win deals. But now she is. She has official uh, authoritative positions. But it's all come from her taking a position, taking a start, and accentuating the areas that she's really good at and saying, I'm going to focus doing that type of work and picking up that type of client. And that's where it all started. Now it's sort of become her positioning has become her position. Richard, there's something you, you call the power pyramid. Tell us about that. Yep. So, yeah, okay. There is another video on this one, by the way, and we do have it on, uh, so maybe there's a link we'll for this to, too. We'll but, try to dig that up and put it in the show notes. Yeah, it's, I know it's, it's on the AMA Architects Marketing Academy um, blog. <coughs> there's a video. But the, the, the pyramid is there are certain levels of power in selling, you know, when we're selling things. Um, at the very bottom, and, and so imagine a pyramid, and at the bottom is where there's not much power, and at the top is where these, these people at the pointy end of the pyramid, they have a lot of power. They, they command high fees. They are sought after. They are revered. They are, there's not many of them. At the bottom, there's lots of them. They tend to be slightly commodity. They get treated like a commodity. And, and, and so I'll just take you through, you know, what happens as you go through. At the very, so at the very bottom, uh, anyone who's selling themselves and, and gets seen as a bit of a salesperson, so they're a commodity. As we go up, the, next, the first level of going up the power pyramid where you have more power and can command higher fees and, and, and all those good things is when you become a specialist. Okay, so a general practitioner is at the bottom. A specialist earns more, is more respected, is more revered, and, and can't be as easily replaced. You know, if you go to the GP and the GP's away on holiday, you can see the locum. They're easily replaceable. The specialist... I have a problem with my brain. I have to wait for the specialist to come back before he, my brain can get sorted out. Okay. So at the bottom, we've got generalist. Specialist is the next level that you want to try and get to. Then you become an authority figure. So they might be the lecturer at the university or, the, you know, these authority figures are sort of almost, they have the certifications. Okay. But you don't need to be have the certifications to be a specialist. Um, and then at the top of the pyramid are the celebrities in our culture we value celebrity endorsement higher than we value you know expert authority endorsement so in psychologists you've got the the normal psychologist then you've got the specialist then you've got the head of the harvard you know psychological uh, department and then you've got dr phil at the top now dr phil earns more than all of them put together he's not necessarily any better but he's the celebrity so our goal with Mona, or with anyone really, is to at least move them up to specialist phase and try and get them seen as a bit of an authority in their niche. And, and if you don't pick too big a niche, it's not that hard. And as you go up, you get more sought after, you can charge higher fees. Um, people who are doing those type of projects are more inclined to gravitate towards you because you are seen as a bit of an expert, a bit of a specialist, a bit of authority. You're probably not going to become a Dr. Phil like a like a uh, Frank Gehry or someone like that, you're probably not going to be that, but you don't need to be. You, you just want nice projects, good projects that you can work on and earn a decent decent fee without getting your fees squeezed all the time. Well, you need to be move up the pyramid and be seen higher up, and that's that's what we did with Mona, and that's what really you should be trying to do to yourself as well. How does someone move up that pyramid, Richard? Uh, okay, we have to we have to look at. Yeah, you're asking these questions. This takes a while to explain. Go watch the video. If I do a bad job explaining it here, go watch the video. But here, let's have a go anyway. What you have to do is surround yourself. Well, at the bottom, people at the bottom tend to have sales brochures. They tend to have uh, websites which look salesy. Um, they, they, they surround themselves, which, which screams out that I'm just a commodity. I'm, I'm an architect. I do any type of work. You know, no job is too big or too small. You know, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do, I do everything, but I specialize in nothing. The people higher up, whoever educates the market owns the market. So the people higher up surround themselves with symbols, which is consistent with people who are higher up. So salespeople have brochures at the bottom. Experts have books. 
So I'll give you I'll give you three or four things that that people up the top have deliberately used to move themselves up the top. Uh, they write a book. Uh, they get themselves interviewed like this today because I'm being interviewed and you're watching me and Enoch talk about you know da la la. I, I carry a certain more authority than if I imagine I'd rung you up and said, "Hey, I'd like to sell you marketing service." I'd cold called you on the phone. How would you react to that? Probably not. You know, he's calling me on the phone. He can't be any good. But if you're watching me talk here on this interview, you immediately think, "Well, Enoch's interviewing him. Enoch's one of the top guys in the world for business. You know, uh, helping out, and he's interviewing Richard Petrie. I'm like, he must be good. He must be good. So there's assumptions. So." You write a book, you get interviewed, you do some PR and get yourself in the paper. Those are three quick and easy ways. Um, is there anything off the top of my head? Oh, who you associate with. So I don't want to say name dropping, but but if you do get yourself, particularly in America where it's such a celebrity culture, you know, if you can be seen hanging out with, with someone famous and it's on your website or maybe it's in your newsletter, then people will see that and, and you will – uh, their credibility will rub off on you a little bit. So, um, by the way, marketers, I was just watching a video. Oh, I might be getting myself in deep water here, but I was watching. Um, no, I might, I might get in trouble if I talk about this. <laughs> you might. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just leave it. But, but, but that's how you do it. And, and by the way, there's a lot of different organisations that do this. Like, so this is what celebrities do. This, it, it's, a, it's, it's. It's a manufactured process to, you know, you, you can do it by waiting for other people to anoint you, um, but you're often waiting a long time to be anointed by your peers to say that you are the, you are the authority or you're the expert. You know, if you wait, it's not in their interest to do that. So you have to do it yourself. And there'll be a lot of people, that be, I know listening to this who'll be too scared, oh, I don't want to promote myself and all that type of thing. It seems unethical and it seems, okay, great. I, I don't know, you know, yes, <laughs> but that's what it's done. That's what celebrities do. It's what... Uh, it's what actors do. It's what all sorts of people in all different professions, not just architecture, do to move up the pyramid. And that's you know that's sort of how you play the game. And you know if you're too scared to do it, write a book or or, or position yourself as an expert. Um, then it, then it limits you big time. Well, Richard, I mean, you're a successful guy. You're the world's leading architect marketing coach. But something people don't know about you is that in the past you've competed at the highest levels of professional sports in New Zealand as a professional cricket player. And something that you shared with me that I learned from you and something that I'm seeing, the more and more um, lessons of success that I learn about how to be successful is a lot of it deals with mindset. Oh, yes, a lot of it. I mean, maybe 80%. So, you know, there's two parts. There's the mechanics of what you need to do. You're dead right. There's the mechanics of what you need to do. And then there's the mindset you need to adopt. So, so one little maybe way of uh, understanding this or, or explaining it that might help um, people is, is a good saying I heard once. I don't even know where it came from and I don't even know um, <laughs> who said it. But it's if you want to be a champion, you need to think like one first. Okay. So if you want to be a champion or you want to be a, you know, in a leading architect or, a, or an off, you know, the best in your field, you need to think like that person first. So this was a, a thing I adopted when I was, I, I, when I was, th I was struggling as a sports person. I wasn't really um, going up the scales. I, I got plateaued and I got stuck. And I thought to myself, you know, I really need to go to the next level. But it's, it wasn't motivation that was stopping me. I was highly motivated, but but I, I couldn't get through the next stop and I wasn't being selected for higher teams and it wasn't going anywhere. And then I started to adopt this thing. If, if I want to be a first-class cricketer or an international cricketer and play at these high, I've got to think like that player first. So I started to sit there and think, okay, if I was, you know, the next level up for me was called first-class. If I'm a first-class cricketer, how would I think? Um, what would I believe? How? What would I think about training? Um, what would I think about, you know, all the hard work and when it got tough and when it got hot and when everyone else is wanting to give up? What would I think then? And I sort of reverse engineered it back. From, oh, to start with, I don't know. But then I sort of thought, I put it together. I, I'd need to think this and I'd need to go for runs when everyone else is going out drinking and I'd need to... I'd need to do this and I'd need to do that and I'd need to enjoy hard work and I'd need to enjoy training. So I trained myself to think that way first. 
And and what tends to happen is there's a lag between reality and your mind. If you can lift your mind up to a certain level and hold the faith and keep keep seeing life as you want it to be and keep seeing yourself as you want it to be, life is a funny way of catching up to you. But there is a delay. You know, there is that faith gap that you do need to stick with it. So if I was a, you know, let's say I was an architect earning 50000 and I wanted to earn a hundred, you've got to train yourself to think like an architect who earns $100,000 a year. And I don't know what that is for you, but you have to know what it is for you. And then you have to train yourself to think that way. And, and life is a funny way of catching up. So that's what I did. And I just did it. And I just took myself up, up, up. How would I think if I was here? How would I think I was there? And, and I think that's what all top sports people who make it and, and, and anyone who's successful in anything, I believe that is what they intuitively tend to do. They tend to take their mind there first and the reality of the situation, then there's a bit of lag time and they have to stick with it and they have to maintain their faith, but there is a delay and they do, life catches up and then they have to think to the next level and the next and the next. There's a marketer who I like listening to, he talks about head trash. And I know that I've had a lot of head trash myself. And, you know, it's only recently clicked for me, Richard, in the past couple of years. I used to think that was a lot of foo-foo. You know, all this personal development stuff and visualization and thinking and, you know, imagining yourself there. Yeah. No, it's, def- it's definitely not. But but you even look, you know, you, it's, it's everywhere, this stuff. You look at someone like Muhammad Ali. Um, did he believe... He was good even bef- before he was. You know, he, the way he talked and the way he thought, I know he was brash and all that type of stuff, but you could see he had trained himself before he f- even fought Sonny Liston. He had trained himself to believe he was the greatest. He had trained himself to to overcome all the obstacles. He, he saw himself as the best, and you see it again and again. Now, the other interesting thing, and, and I'm, not, I'm not overly religious or anything like that, but if you look in the Bible and, and – like I say, I'm no expert on the Bible. I shouldn't be preaching it. But I know there's there's a lot of stuff in the Bible which lines up with this. You know, ask in the knowledge that you shall receive and you shall receive or something like that. You know, it, it, it talks about a lot of the stuff. The Bible is almost, um, you know, one of the earliest self-help books. There's so much stuff in there that's in line with all this type of sports psychology that, you know, there must be something in it somewhere and it seems to work. Thanks for bringing a bit of religion to the program, Richard. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> well, Richard, I think we've covered a lot today, and hopefully our listeners have got a lot out of it. Now, they can go to Business of Architecture and forward slash FAB and get the FAB training video that we talked about last episode. And then also in the links to this video, we'll go ahead and put the power pyramid. So we'll make that available if you go to Business of Architecture forward slash pyramid and you can pick up that Power Pyramid video that Richard was talking about. So, Richard, what's what's next on the horizon? Where are you going? What's the future look like? Well, look, I, you know, since, since I teamed up with you and Eric, it's, we've been trying to save the world one architect at a time. We're on a, we're on a mission to help architects around the world. Um, you know, w- w- with the Architects Marketing Academy, it's, it's through helping them communicate better and, and, and solve their services. Because I honestly believe... Architects are given a real raw job that, you know, you guys you guys work for eight years like a doctor and you end up, I don't know, doing a whole lot of – you're not treated like a doctor. You, you're being commoditized to a, to a great degree. So we need to sort that out. You know, we need to get you communicating in a way which, which redresses the balance. So, I, you know, I'm enjoying specializing in helping architects market themselves because it – it gets easier and easier because it's the same problems coming up again and again. So as we see these problems, we, we you know we're able to come up with tools and resources to help them. So I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying that. Um, that you know there is a lot of free stuff. So so put your name down for some of that stuff. There's some stuff you can pay for which takes it further. But um, thoroughly enjoying working with architects. It's sort of seventy uh, percent of my work at the moment. But uh, really enjoying it, and and it's really great working with people from around the world. So uh, I'm having a blast. Uh, so I'm, I'm pleased I've come into this little, funny little world of architects. <laughs> well, Richard, thanks for joining us in the funny little world of architects. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. If you enjoyed today's show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. There are two reasons to do this. First, it encourages me to continue making free content for you to run a fulfilling and profitable practice. 
And secondly, it allows others to find this content inside of iTunes so that they can benefit as well. For free resources for running an architecture practice that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the join button to unlock your account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, boost profitability, start a firm, and much more. Until next week, this has been the Business of Architecture. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.